Hello and welcome to this Power of Television conversation, Casting Call to Action, Achieving Diversity on Television. I'm Jazz Tanke, the Senior Artisans Editor at Variety, and in this conversation we'll be talking about the art form of casting and how it shapes what we see on our screens. We'll also be talking about how casting for inclusion can strengthen both storytelling and the entertainment industry itself. As a creative and powerful craft, we find that every time we talk about any kind of representation on television, the conversation almost always turns to casting. We're thankful for our experts joining us here today. With us, we have two incredibly accomplished casting directors, both of whom are current Emmy nominees, and we have a prominent casting executive. We also have an expert in the field who has been collecting and analyzing data on uh, on screen representation. First, we have Kim Coleman, who has worked on American Crime and Lovecraft Country. She also serves on the Television Academy Board of Governors and is a newly elected governor of the Motion Picture Academy's Casting Directors Branch. We have Beth Bowling, also a CSA award-winning casting director who has received Emmy nominations for her work on Mad Men, Mr. Robot, and currently The Flight Attendant. Grace Wu is an executive vice president of casting at entertainment content at NBC Universal Television and Streaming. There she is responsible for overseeing both scripted and unscripted casting and talent across the division's many entertainment platforms. She has supervised the casting of scripted series and pilots that include Friday Night Lights, Freaks and Geeks, Parenthood, New Amsterdam, and This Is Us. Also joining the conversation with us, we have Dr. Nanachka McTarget. She is the Associate Vice President of Research and Insights at the Gina Davis Institute on Gender in Media. She is a diversity and inclusion specialist with expertise on issues of race, gender, inequality, and popular culture, and will help share some insights for us today. Hello and welcome to you all. So before we dive in, let's hear about how you got your start in the industry and when you first got interested in casting. And Kim, I'm going to start with you. It started when I was a kid. I, I love all television shows and in movies. And I used to watch, watch uh, TV shows and movies with my grandmother. On well, Friday nights, we would watch all, it was a lineup of uh, great shows like uh, Love American Style, the original Fantasy Island, uh, on Sundays, the Ed Sullivan Show. And um, these, these are shows that I'm sure a lot of folks won't know about, but they should look them up. They were all great. All wonderful. <laughs> and I loved the movies as well. You know, all about Eve with Betty Davis and Ann Baxter, Carmen Jones, Dorothy Dandridge, Imitation of Life. And I want, I'm mentioning all of these movies and shows because I think young, young actors or young people should look them up. I think they'll learn a lot from them. And um, after watching all these shows and movies, um, I would always see at the end, I would see the name casting by Lynn Stallmaster. And I kept saying, oh my gosh, I want to be. Like like Lynn Stallmaster, I th I think she, I think she's great. I want to do what she's doing, but little did I know that Lynn Stallmaster <laughs> was was a he. But you know, <laughs> Lynn was called L Y N N, so I just assumed it was a woman. But in any way, um, I said I want to do that. And many many years later, I was fortunate enough to uh, to meet the iconic Lynn Stallmaster, and and it was like a dream come true. So that's that's basically how I got you know my love. For TV and film, and uh, starting my career, I interned for six months. I was an assistant for about four years, a casting assistant, and then I was promoted to a uh, casting associate. Another another three years. After seven years, um, I uh, partnered with uh, a well-established casting director, and uh, then I went on my own. It was a little scary, but uh, I was always a hard worker, and I just continued to build my resume. And I've been fortunate and blessed ever since. And and here we are. Beth, what about for you? What's your story? Um, my story is a little similar to Kim. I was obsessed with um, television and movies as a child, and both of my parents were cinephiles. My dad and I 
my dad would take me to see really inappropriate movies for a young child to see. Um, my mom and I would sit and watch Doris Day and Rock Hudson movies until like one in the morning. Um, and it was something that I didn't really know there was a career path for that until later in life, I had an opportunity to work for free on an independent film, uh, to look for extras in the Bronx. And um, I think I continued to work for free for a, a long enough time that my parents were worried about my career trajectory. <laughs> and then I got my first um, paid job looking for Demi Moore's son in a, a movie called The Juror with Alec Baldwin. And so we did a search around New York and that was that was back in the day where you had to beat the streets and hang up flyers and, you know, rent auditoriums. And I just loved it. And I'm so grateful that I love what I do. And um, I, yeah, I'm very grateful for that. Grace, what's your journey to executive vice president at NBC Universal Television and Streaming? Well, similar to Beth and to Kim, I also was somebody who just loved television growing up. I grew up in, in LA. I was, you know, that classic latchkey kid. So the minute I got home, I, you know, I fixed myself a snack and just like parked myself in front of the TV, you know, while I was trying to get some homework done. Um, but I also think growing up in LA, I had a lot of exposure to people whose parents were in the business, you know, mine weren't. And I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, like that could be your job, like being a writer or a director or even an actor. Um, and I, you know, I would, I was, I did high school theater um, when I was growing up, but, you know, never wanted to be a performer, but always just love that community of just, you know, putting on a show and just, and just feeling like those are the kind of people that I like being with. And so when I, um, after college, I got a job as a production assistant on a television series at ABC and my, um, where, where I hung out in the trailer was right next to the casting directors. And they would, this is back in the day when we would have to like actually open, you know, submissions of headshots. And I, they would ask me to organize them by agency. And I just remember thinking, this is so fun. Like I, I get, can't believe I'm getting to hold headshots and I'm helping actors sign in. And that was it. I, I just thought this is what I want to do. And I got a job as an assistant, I mean, intern and then an assistant similar to what Beth and Kim were saying, you know, just sort of worked my way up. I worked um, in a really great casting office, um, Lieberman Hirschfeld, which at the time did a lot of, um, you know, the big shows on TV like Seinfeld and um, Party of Five and Third Rock from the Sun and just, and Mark and Meg, who um, whose company it was, like they were just incredible mentors and I, I just, I loved it. And while I, I definitely could see myself being a casting director, for the rest of my career, when this opportunity came up to be, you know, like a junior level executive at NBC, I just thought I'll just go on the interview for experience and, you know, come back to freelance casting. And then I just kind of stuck around and have been here now almost 23 years. But I feel like for me, at least I think when I'm, and I've worked with Beth and Kim before and they're incredibly talented, um, but I always feel like I'm so grateful for the experience that I had, you know, being an online person because I, definitely have understanding of what their process is and, you know, certainly empathy. And so I don't, I sort of don't sort of approach it or come <laughs> at them with, you know, unrealistic expectations. Yeah, I love that. And thank you for that insight into, into your work. Dr. Nanachka Taggart, let's hear from you. Like talk about the Gina Davis Institute and your work there as the Associate Vice President of Research and Insights. Yeah, so a little bit about me. I actually came from the academic world. Um, I've been in, you know, uh, getting a PhD takes a really long time. So uh, I come from looking at, you know, uh, race, gender, and inequality, um, looking at issues of representation from a sociolo sociological uh, perspective, um, more of a macro perspective. So, um, you know, also I grew up in Los Angeles, like Grace uh, did, and I was huge. TV fan, movie fan, music fan. Um, my parents are Jamaican immigrants, so TV for us was really uh, like a lifeline into American culture. Um, so I think that's what inspired me to study, you know, race, gender, inequality, and also popular culture, film, and TV. So at the Gina, Gina Davis Institute, um, it's kind of a perfect match. I get to study all of those things, uh, you know, and we do research um, 
on all of these issues. Uh, for instance, yesterday we actually just report on the API um, and representation, um, which was kind of groundbreaking. Um, a study has never been done like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know what else to say, but um, just super, super grateful to have my job and to be able to, um, you know, look at representation and how to make things, you know, more equitable, uh, diverse and inclusive. Yeah. Let's talk about some changes that you've all seen over the last, certainly over the last few years, as there's a spotlight on the lack of diversity or, you know, the, the call for diversity and inclusivity across, you know, in the entertainment industry. Like what, what have you, what changes have you seen? Grace, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, I think that, you know, certainly in my time, as an executive, you know, we've always, I think, you know, network, broadcast networks have always had our, you know, be held to the fire by, I think, the, you know, um, either, you know, particular coalition groups or the media when they feel like we're not reflecting authentic um, portrayals of, you know, communities of people, ethnic groups. And so I think for me, it was, it's been an interesting evolution because I think that networks, and certainly where, where I sit, I, I've never felt like there was ever an impediment to cast diverse, but I feel like what's evolved is the intention in terms of working with more diverse creators who have very distinctive experiences that want to cast actors that will tell their story. And I think that's where I'm really, I'm seeing the just, again, like the priority and the intention of working with creators who want to, again, tell their stories and have, have characters that may not look, you know, as uh, may feel distinctive and, and may not feel as familiar. And that, and that frankly, as networks, I don't think people are, are I think they're embracing that, that change um, and that intention. And they're not, they're not running from it because we're realizing that there's obviously, a, especially in this moment that we're living in, where we're going through such a cultural reckoning in our world, not just our country. Um, I think people are just, they're just sick and tired of being sick and tired of not seeing themselves. Yeah. And Kim, what about you? What changes have you seen? I mean, you know, for those who don't know, and they should, uh, you know, you're what you've, you've worked, you've been a frequent collaborator with Tyler Perry and, you know, the Tyler Perry Studios and Spike Lee. So, yeah, share what, you know, changes you've seen. Yeah, both, both the, Tyler and, and Spike are both amazing to work with. I, I learn from them both, you know, every time we uh, we work on a project. But to Grace's point too, I think as a casting director, you know, part of my job is to help guide my showrunners and producers and directors. And I try to put as many different types of people and actors in front of them as possible. Yeah, I try to educate people on new voices as, as much as I can while, uh, you know, staying true to the spirit of the story and the vision of the filmmaker. Um, I feel that there are more opportunities than ever uh, to tell stories of a wide, wide variety of experiences today. Uh, you know, the world is changing out, everything is in the transition, and we have to, um, you know, they have to write to that. We have to honor that. And I just, part of my job is to make sure that, you know, there's room for improvement. And um, I think the television process is collaborative and um, it's important, you know, to multiple perspectives. I like to bring also like personal experiences into my work and influence uh, over a project. And I, you know, and hope that my voice and opinions you know, help form a mean, meaningful collective vision. And usually with my uh, creator, creatives, they're, they're always pretty wide, pretty open. So I think everyone is, uh, I think there used to be a closed-minded mentality, but I think that is, I think that's over. Yeah. Beth, what about for you? Like, how have you seen, you know, the, the call for diversity, inclusivity, change but also to kim's point like you know that important relationship or collaboration with the directors and showrunners to ensure 
that you are bringing as many faces to them as possible. Yeah, I think, you know, I think awareness is the first step to change. And I think we have that now in our industry, like we are there and conversations have happened and they're happening. And I know the casting society is really pushing a movement for um, exclusivity. So as a casting director, you want to have the conviction to keep keep that force alive. Um, I mean, I was working with one of my favorite writer directors, Sam Esmail this year. And when we were talking about all the roles in his show, he said, by the way, every role could be trans. I just want the best actor. So I think when you have, like Kim said, creatives like that, who are a driving force to change, um, that's really important. And um, to have that support from your creatives is, um, I think it, you know, it's going to make a big difference. And I, I have seen a huge change. And I think what's what I find is I love when casting happens organically, and it's not like a TikTok mandate checklist box. Well, this role should be this, that role should be that. So for me personally, as a creative person, you know, I just want it to come together naturally. And, and it's my job to be aware and sensitive to try to find underrepresented actors and um, give people a chance to shine and put them in roles that they might not have been cast in before. Yeah. Now, Nojka, what is representation looking like to you now, you know, given that these efforts have been underway for some time? And I think, you know, as Beth said, like, now we are seeing the change more than ever uh, because, you know, people's feet are being held to the fire. So talk about what you've seen. Well, I've seen just even at the Institute, just the reception we've been getting for our work and, and folks coming in and wanting to do projects with us and really reflect on their diversity and inclusion in their own, you know, companies, organizations. Um, we've seen it spike um, over, you know, the last year or so. And I think going back to what a couple of you said is the idea of awareness is so important. Um, we kind of had like a social reckoning of last summer and commenting on this from like a sociological perspective is like the idea I think now people are realizing that if they don't make changes, they're going to get left behind. Um, and that now it's the time for accountability. Um, I think, um, that's pretty much what I've seen. And so I do think there's progress because there is accountability. But one other comment I wanted to make is the idea of, you know, quotas and, and checklists don't matter. I think, Beth, you, you mentioned that it's not about checking a box. Um, and that's something we look at at the Institute is not only quantity of representation, so numbers are important in the data, but also the quality of representation. We really focus on that because a lot of the things are not going to be seen um, just by counting, right? You want to know, obviously, if someone's playing a stereotypical role, if there's 10 people of color in this show, but they're all playing stereotypical roles, that also is not a good thing. So I think um, quality is, is one of the important things um, to look for as far as diversity inclusion um, going ahead in time now. Yeah. So let's talk about how you go about finding you know new talent like where ha i mean you know we've had the last year of the pandemic where you physically couldn't be in a room having you know a day of audition so talk about navigating that and yeah where's the place to go for casting yeah, I actually feel like i for me i feel like um, the the work from home has been while well, a challenge and an adjustment. It's actually been it's it's removed obstacles to meet actors that I normally would because I'm based in LA that I would normally have to wait for them to come to LA or if I'm in my New York office wait for them to come to New York or if I happen to be traveling to London or you know anywhere else where I can meet talent because I can honestly if I if I watch a show or see a movie and, or I read an article about a performer and they happen to live in Australia or the UK or even in Asia I can set up a Zoom. And you know, obviously, maybe coordinate some some time zone issues, but that's just been the kind of the light bulb moment for me. I just I kind of thought I can't believe I 
didn't realize I could do this before. I that I, I just felt like, <laughs> well, I have to wait till they come to town before I could actually get get eyes on this person and get a sense of their personality and see if I think they're they're right for the show I'm working on. So, I that's just been awesome. Where I feel like now I'm just and you know. I've been having, I still have generals, you know, every, with my team every day where we're meeting actors from all over the country, all over the world. And I, I think that's just been really illuminating and for me really inspired because we've actually been able to hire some of these actors on our pilots and series. Um, and so I, that's been, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I don't know for Beth and Kim, if you guys have had the same experience, but I just felt like I can't believe I wasn't taking advantage of the technology that was there in front of me the whole time. Yeah, it, it's been, it's been, um, it's been incredible, actually. It's, uh, you know, again, yeah, you get to meet so many different actors that maybe we would not have uh, met before. And so many actors, you know, uh, turning in their self tapes with their perfect lighting and the perfect background. It's just been, it's been great. It, it, and they yeah. feel, a, a lot of times, some of the actors feel more at ease, not physically being in the room with us. And, um, you know, we get a chance to chat and, and I think they're more relaxed and we get to, you know, maybe do the scene, you know, several different ways without having, you know, other actors waiting outside and you have to look at them on your way out the door. So it's been a, it's been, it's been a challenge. It's been challenging. And uh, I, I will say, I think sometimes you, in the room, there's some magic that happens that you can recreate, you know, but um, I think it's for the most part, it's been great. I mean, I've cast so many pilots in shows, you know, remotely, it's, it's amazing. And everyone was pretty nervous about how is this going to play out? Especially if you have to do a chemistry read and, you know, are you going to feel the chemistry and you actually can feel it. So it's, it's been, a uh, it's been great for me. Yeah. Going back to what Grace said, I mean, I'm actually meeting with an actress who's in Taipei and it'll be 6 AM her time and 6 PM my time when we're done with this today. So it's definitely opened up the world and why we weren't thinking about this before. I don't know, <laughs> but I will say I do miss being in the room. I do miss like being in a little small box with an actor and having the hair stand up on my arms and seeing the, you know, them bring something to life. There is that, but, but we, you know, we've proven that we can get it done and we, you know, we kept our industry working. And I think that's really what's important. And, um, you know, I think our industry was, you know, cutting edge on get COVID testing and, you know, keeping, keeping everything rolling. And, you know, thankfully we did have, you know, online platforms so we could still do our jobs and still produce and still get things cast. Yeah. I love that. Like the world is, is has almost become your casting oyster in a way because thanks to, you know, these new platforms. But, you know, talk about how you address inclusivity when you take on a project. I know we, we've kind of touched on it, but like go into more detail about that and how influential, you know, you can be as casting directors, you know, when it comes to representation and diversity? You know, I think, I know for me, you know, as a, as a network casting executive, I'm always weary about react, being reactive because I think that for so many of us, you know, we all hear it. We are, we're all, we all hear the beating drum of, you know, um, diverse uh, series regulars, diverse leads and, and wanting to, you know, be, and be intentional about like, uh, about identifying those actors. But I think, you know, you can't like, we have, I think when you're a casting director and you just have it in your bones where you, you don't ever want to compromise and put the wrong actor in a role simply because you're, you're being told that you've got to fit into this slot, like, it, or this person's got to fit into the slot. You want to be able to identify the actor that's going to elevate a role, that's going to, to be successful in a role. And so that's something that I think about a lot, because especially because things are moving so quickly and there's so much pressure on, on all of us. You know, whether you're an online casting director like, you know, like Beth and Kim, or certainly on my end of it, where I understand everybody's um, intention right now about having diverse casts. And I think we all hold hands and, and agree on that. But I always want to make sure that we are, again, putting the right actors in the role and not just simply like saying, OK, um, I've got, you know, I've got my 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 black actor, my Asian actor. It's just that doesn't 
doesn't, yeah. I don't think that feels organic. It doesn't feel thoughtful. It doesn't feel very creative. And so, you know, my thing is like, guess what? You know, someone could have like maybe they have three Asian friends or three black friends. Like it doesn't right. have to right. just always be single. Yeah. You know, it has to be such one offs. And so I think that's where I'm all, where I always, you know, when I talk to, about diversity with our development executives, when we're picking up material um, and even talking to our showrunners and just saying, you know, and they, again, everyone's so well intentioned. They want to always be diverse and inclusive in the cast. But my feeling is like, that's great. I, we all are in, in agreement about that, but let's just make sure that we're putting the right actors in these roles so that your, your vision's being executed and that we're not just sort of, you know, checking off boxes. I, I agree. I, I think, I think now we should be telling stories that are written for, for, for these characters rather than shove actors into roles that they're not right for, just for the sake of optics or checking diversity boxes. I always want the best actor for the role. That's 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 my take on it. And and I try to um, you know, the best actor for the role, no matter their race or gender, gender, it's just when I'm looking at a cast, I mean, I feel like it has to, you know, to, to uh, to Grace's point, it feel organic. It has to feel real. You know, it. it everyone doesn't have a the world that we live in. A friend, you know, of five different ethnicities. I mean, you know, we have to be real true to the world that we live in. And sometimes it's like, oh, but we need to. Um, we want to make sure that we have this, this, you know, and 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 also with with uh, actors of color. Sometimes it's a situation where you, you want, you know, they'll say the diversity of, you know, the, the you know, the complexion, like this person oh. is lighter skin, this person is, you know, a darker complexion person. It's like, it's about being the best actor for the job, not, you know, not trying to be, you know, the, uh, the poster child for, you know, colors of Benetton. It, you know, it just doesn't feel real to me. So that's, I'm always, um, very, um, very conscious of that. And I think with my showrunners and, and, and directors and producers, uh, and they listen because a lot of times it's, um, you know, they're hearing, you know, different, you know, certain people in their ears and they, they want to make sure that they're making the right decisions, but you have to keep it real and, you know, and, and current and not just, uh, yeah, not just check the boxes. And I, on every show that I work on, I, I try to make sure of that. And I find myself sometimes, <laughs> you know, really pushing for the, non-actors of color <laughs> at this point. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> I, I, agree. I mean, I agree with everything Kim and Grace said. Um, I also think going back to what Dr. Ninochka said, it's important not to do like tropes and stereotypes and be aware of that, you know, and, um, and just, you know, going back to just having the awareness and the sensitivity of all the up underrepresented people and how they're represented and how do you want to represent them. Um, so I just think, you know, from a casting perspective, sometimes you, it's actually my job to be like, hey, guys, do you really want that? I don't want to throw out like some really over the top stereotype examples, but is that really what you want to portray? It's written like this. What if we did this instead? Um, because the conversations need to be had. Yeah, no, and I love that. And I love that, Beth, that you're highlighting what casting directors do because we are, I think, just sort of, thank goodness there's checks and balances to this process, right? And so that, I mean, look, sometimes we do, you, you do work with like absolute like geniuses, like, you know, like some of the producers that you guys have worked with and you just kind of, you're, you hang on for, for the ride and they have excellent taste and great instincts and you, you're always in lockstep. But that sometimes when people just have, you know, just unconscious biases or blind spots, I was just thinking about we, um, in, in the new reorg of our company, The Sinner is a show that I started overseeing for USA and it, um, it's in its fourth season and it's, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's except for Bill Pullman, it really kind of resets every season. And this upcoming season, um, there was an Asian American family at the center. And I remember when I first, I read the first script, I, you know, obviously because of, of my um, experience, I just, or uh, who I am, I just remember thinking like, oh God, these are like just very familiar, like stereotypes that just make me really uncomfortable. And that frankly don't, um, 
don't kind of push the boundaries of how honestly like an Asian American man is seen in a sexualized way because he was going to be, a, he's a love interest for our female lead, how the, the immigrant parents are portrayed and because they always seem so angry and um, like just sort of the marginalized outsiders. And I feel like you've seen that a million times. I frankly have a very grumpy Asian dad. So I feel like I get that trope, but I don't need to see it perpetually on another series. So I just remember like having that conversation right away, just saying like, one, I really want to find this hot as hell sexy dude for our female lead. And I know that he's out there and we, we did find that actor. So I'm happy about that. And you got to like show this Asian couple, like actually like having some moments of levity, like they're not always arguing with each other or with other people, like just humanize and give them some dimension because we've seen that outsider, you know, portrayal before. And it just doesn't, it doesn't feel good. Certainly if you're, a, you know, an Asian person watching the show and it doesn't frankly change people's perceptions um, of how Asian, Asian families are seen on television. And maybe I could yeah. just jump in to uh, <laughs> speak to um, kind of from the research side and what we're seeing overall in trends and why representation matters overall. Um, I think what you said, Grace, was the idea that, you know, representations really matter um, if we're not you know whoever we see on the screen let's say we don't have any interaction with that group that is our stand-in or substitute for that group so it's really important when you know people are like oh it's just a stereotype it's a trope it's really important for us to really reflect on what we are putting out there because it is powerful if someone hasn't had any interaction let's say with an api person then like you said, that family might be the only representation they've seen or any interaction they've had with, with Asian Americans. Um, so I think another point I wanted to talk about is symbolic annihilation. And I don't know if you've, you're familiar with that term, but it's mm -hmm. the idea that, um, you know, basically representation in the fictional world um, you know, means social existence or signifies social existence here. Let me actually read the exact quote because I don't want to butch butcher it. So representation on the fictional world signifies social existence and absence means symbolic annihilation. And it's basically pointing to the importance of having representation on screen. Um, media does have the power in its worst form to fuel social inequality. So if we're really representing, um, you know, a divi diverse and inclus inclusive group of, you know, talent on screen, that does a lot for, um, you know, reflections to uh, overall society and helping lessen social um, inequality. So, um, yeah, I just, you know, when folks are like, oh, well, it's just TV. No, it's not just TV, right? TV is kind of a window into our society. So it's really important that we, you know, pay attention. So I know we have a lot of students who are tuning into this as, you know, as casting directors, you know, what can you offer? What advice can you offer to those young people who are thinking of exploring a career in the industry or, you know, who are learning about casting? Well, I'll, I'll start. Um... What I often say to you know aspiring young people, do do your research. I, you know, I, I watch everything, new and old. Even if it's something you're not necessarily drawn to at first, uh, things might surprise you. Um, and I, just familiarize yourself with actors of all ages, genders, races. It's important to know what you like and what you don't like. I, I, you know, I, I it's, it's important to take in like different types of people in the, in, the, in the real world as well. And I just learn about different types of people, what certain people act, you know, act like in a certain way, different parts of the country. I just feel like, you know, as a young actor or someone in, entering the business, just 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 be prepared for you, you know, for any opportunity that comes along. You know, audition for projects, big or small. Focus on performance and training, and become so good that that your talent is undeniable and you know an opportunity presents itself for you to audition or be reviewed you know we have no choice but to say hey this person has something 
and see where you know where they fit. That would, that would be my advice. Yeah. Grace, I would, you, know what, you know what I would say is that I feel like when I look back on, you know, moments where and look like anything else, like, you know, we all evolve as people and get more confidence as we, you know, as we get experience and, and frankly get older. But like, I, I just, there are times when I, I just feel like um, have the have the conviction of a point of view and have the confidence to articulate it. Because for me, the, the, one of the things I love the most about casting is really understanding material and understanding care or having a, um, having a point of view about what a character's arc is in a script or a series and being able to talk to a, a showrunner about it so that I can know how to advocate for an actor that they may not see. And I think that if that's, if that's something that you, you actually have interest in, if you love reading material and you, are comfortable talking about, you know, why you think a character should be played, a, you know, a, you know, maybe consider a different type of actor that might be on the page and, and be able to articulate why and advocate for a different point of view. I think do that because I feel like that's, those are always the, the conversations that I've enjoyed having, you know, in my, in my job. And also what I've always found inspired when you feel like, oh my God, I can actually affect change. Like, I actually got this writer to to maybe see this role in a different way, and I had a, an, an actor to then to present to support why I felt like we could, you know, you should you could explore looking at this in a different way that you might have uh, might have envisioned. So I just think be like just I mean again dedicate yourself to really like reading material and like with a very kind of thoughtful mind and have some confidence about why you feel like you know maybe you can. Why an actor? Should, why they should maybe consider a different kind of actor for a role that they may not have have first uh, imagined. Love that, Beth. What about for you? Um, just to backtrack, are we uh, with your question? Are we talking about actors or people who want to get into casting? People who want to get into to casting. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so for me, I would say. Um, the one thing that is really important because I've seen this with assistants coming and going in my life, it's really long hours to be a casting director and anything I think in our business. And you're always on the clock, whether your clock is really, you're really on the clock or not, it's, it's almost 24 seven, especially if you're casting an episodic television show, something could happen over the weekend, you know, something could happen at midnight. It's just, it's, you have to really, love it. You have to really love it to want to, you know, work these hours and it's fun and it's creative, but there is also a sense of professionalism that you need to remember. It is a business. And, um, you know, for anyone in New York, I think if you could see as much theater as possible, and I know theater is astronomically expensive, but, you know, go to the TKTS booth or try to get free tickets from friends, but, you know, just try to see as much as you can. And like Kim said, watch as much as you can and um, watch people's performances. Cause a big part of the job, as Grace said, when you're trying to sell an actor for, to someone is why you feel like they're right for the part is you have to really know what they've done and see what they've done and be able to recite their performances and their range. And, um, it's a lot, it's a lot of homework. You know, I feel like whenever I'm watching anything, I'm working cause I'm no, you know, my notes are going off in my head. Well, why don't I know them? Who are they? You know? And then yeah. I'm, on my phone, what, what, what have I seen them in? You know, it just, it's, it doesn't end. So you need to really love what you're doing and be prepared to, to be working all the time. When I was starting out, another thing is I used to buy every magazine, every newspaper, yeah. you know, from J14 to, I don't know, Cosmopolitan, just to, just to keep up on, you know, current events, who's, who, you know, who's the hot young, uh, you know, singers or, you know, actors. So just, just keep your ears and eyes open. Be a sponge. Yes. I, I remember when we were doing the pilot, we were doing the pilot for Freaks and Geeks. And as you can imagine, like, you know, Judd Apatow and Paul Feig, they just wanted like fresh faces, like no one who felt too slick or polished. And so I remember thinking, oh, I love this. I mean, Alison Jones is like an amazing casting director and she did open calls and would, you know, with, like was reading people everywhere. But I remember, um, I had, I just read an article in Time Magazine, just to Kim's point, on Eric, Aaron McGruber. He was just starting his Boondocks comic strip. 
And I remember like mm-hmm. thinking, oh, this is like a real nerd, <laughs> like but in a good, like in a good way, like right for this show. And so I tracked him down. Like this is like before we had the World Wide Web. I don't know. I must have called information because <laughs> it's web. And I cold, call, I cold called him. And his mom answered the phone, and I got him on the phone. And you know, I think he was like seventeen or eighteen at the time. And I said. Hi, you know, I, I just saw this article about you in in, in Time Magazine, and you know, we're we're casting this show. It's um, you know, it's about kid, real kids in high school, and it just feels like this is, you know, it might be. I don't know if you've ever thought about being a performer, but clearly you're a creative person who just, you know, has a, I think, has an interesting eye. And I remember he was just like, uh, no, like, uh, no, I'm not doing. It. <laughs> and I remember thinking like, okay, good luck to you, kid. And then of course, you know, boondocks. But I just, I, it just again, it's like it is that thing of like you're just always. I feel like you can't lose, you don't lose that thing when you're a casting director. You're just always just on the lookout. You're always just so, you're like, you're just open. You're open to being inspired and, and like, kind of like getting smitten with people, which I love. I love, this is like the part of the job that I love, just like the, the opportunities to, to find. Like, I remember meeting Busy Phillips and just being like, what a sassafras. Like, and we needed that foul mouth, mouth mean girl on Tates and Geeks. And it was like, perfect. So yeah, you just are always like, <laughs> you're open and you're like observing and you're paying attention and you're assessing and maybe judging but you know it's what we do <laughs> that is incredible advice and i want to thank you all thank you beth kim grace and anachka thank you to the television academy foundation and our sponsors at stars please take a look at their hashtag take the lead initiative that is bringing a lot of fresh faces to the screen. And thank you to my panel once again and the audience for joining us today.